Hello, and welcome to the second full episode of The Fearless Hour, a time for saving graces. I am Dr. Tamir Siddiqui, and with me is the show's originator and producer, D. Patrick Miller. Hi. We're here to explore the saving grace of forgiveness in this hour, in the company of two extraordinary guests. Our featured musician is David Knopfler, who started the legendary band known as Dire Straits, and who's been a friend of Patrick's for years. In addition to one older video, David has recorded two of his favorite songs from home exclusively for this episode of The Hour. Both Patrick and I will say our pieces on forgiveness. Mine is entitled The Psychology of Forgiveness, and it will come right after David's first video. Later, Patrick interviews novelist Wally Lamb, whose best-selling novel, I Know This Much Is True, deals with forgiveness at length, 900 pages, as a matter of fact. Last year, HBO released a six-episode limited series based on the book, for which actor Mark Ruffalo won a lead actor Emmy. In their chat, Patrick and Wally will talk about how that production came about and the role that forgiveness has played in Wally's amazing output as a novelist and teacher of writing. Near the end, Patrick will reveal the flavor of forgiveness, and then we'll close with a meditation on the blossoming of forgiveness, bringing together Patrick's photography and brief excerpts from his forgiveness book with the music of London composer Natasha Mirren. Thanks, Tamir. We're going to jump right into the uh, show here. Oh, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. Um, I've just been handing a, a breaking news. Uh, see that, it's breaking news. Uh, it's from uh, my housemate, Wynn Minter. Come, come down into the picture. Uh, he's, uh, he has an actual theater degree, so he's in charge of props. So we're, he's, and he's gonna help me uh, figure out what this breaking news is. Oh, I see. Are you ready? Yeah. Happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday, birthday to you. Happy birthday, Demir Sadiq Saidi. Happy birthday to you. What is happening? <laughs> wow. Now, thank you so much. Right. But there's more to what? this. There's what? more to this. What now, viewers of the show that have been with us since the beginning, the pilot episode, um, know that you are a magician. And your real purpose on the show is to undo all our illusions. You burn up your house. So, so still. <laughs> so, <laughs> we got a commotion going on here. Um, so I have your uh, little birthday cake here. Oh my goodness, Patrick. And I want you to blow it out from Chicago. Now, viewers will know that this is a real magic trick because it's completely unrehearsed. And in fact, Tamir had no idea this was going to happen. Not in the script. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you go go right ahead and blow out this candle. Wow! Thank you so much. God bless you. No, you have to. <laughs> I'll come up closer. How's that? Okay. There, we got it. Perfect. We got Done. it. That's there amazing. We go. Magic. I don't, I don't know how you do it. And, and thank um, you both so much. That was so <laughs> yeah. sweet. What a pleasant surprise. Uh, and now magicians never reveal their secrets. <laughs> no, they don't. But I do want to thank um, Wynn and our uh, sponsor, the Vornado Fan Company, um, <laughs> which, which uh, provided unspecified <laughs> technical assistance. <laughs> okay. I love it. Okay. And, and, and with that, the fearless hour has officially crossed the line from being a time for saving graces to a time for silly stuff. Um, <laughs> I love it. Thank you. We, we should proceed into the show now because forgiveness is such a rich topic that um, our segments are probably going to exceed 60 minutes this time around. Um, as always, there's a schedule on the YouTube page just beneath this video. So you can return to or review any section uh, at will. Um, also, please visit the show page, which you can find by going to uh, my website, fearlessbooks.com. And there you can become uh, an ambassador, a contributor, or an advertising sponsor so that we can continue to explore the saving graces like creativity, 
higher self, silliness, and so on. <laughs> but right now, let's check in with a veteran rocker from across the waters. I'm happy to be here um, with David Knopfler, who's not actually here. He's in the UK through the, <laughs> through the miracle of Zoom recording. The magic of Zoom, yeah. And I want to tell the listeners uh, how we met, which okay. was that 15 years ago, Maybe I got more. a... Was it really only 15? <laughs> yeah, a short <laughs> cryptic email, which said, um, I am looking for help editing a poetry book. Wow. Sincerely, David. Oh, and it also said, I am a musician in the UK. Okay. Sincerely, David. And then your signature had Knopfler.com. <laughs> and it struck me for two reasons. One, I seldom get poetry editing inquiries, especially from out of the blue. Right. Um, and, and second, there was something, a little bell was going off. I kept thinking, not flur, where, not flur, where do I know that flur. name from? Sure. A musician in the UK. Why why does this <laughs> why does this sound familiar? So I went to the your site, notflur.com, and saw why you were familiar that you uh, started a band known as, as Dire Straits <laughs> with your sure. brother Mark. So I wrote back to you and said, Hey, you're a rock star. <laughs> Oddly. And you answered. And I, I'll always treasure this response. You answered, sorry, chap, gave all that up years ago. <laughs> um, okay. So we, we went on from there to do an, uh, a lengthy inter email interview, which is still, still on the site. There, yeah. And it will be linked. It's linked from the show I periodically page. Get, I periodically, periodically get people sending it to me thinking I don't know about it. <laughs> right. And it's still quite popular. It has a, a pretty gets steady the odd, yeah, it gets the readership. So uh, what we're going to do today is uh, through the course of the show, um, we'll have three videos of your songs. Um, the first is if, good, if God Could Make the Angels. And this is actually the video I have, which I... Um, impolitely ripped from YouTube is <laughs> uh, actually, a, I think it was actually a film because it's like 20 years old and it looks like it has a film grain quality. Might have been, might have been filmed in Germany from a TV show. Probably. Oh was. yeah. Very beautifully uh, shot. And then uh, two videos that I'm proud to say uh, 20 no, years one, later. no one has ever seen because you. And they'll all say, my God, what happened to him? <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, I was going to say, David, you haven't really changed the white dye job, you know, is questionable, but that's, that's, that's personal fashion. That's yours. Yeah, it's, it's the 30 pounds that I put on since then that bother me more, which is 25 of which came during the lockdown and COVID. Right, right. Um, a personal question. Oh, and I wanted to uh, show, and this may give you a supply and demand problem, okay. uh, that we did succeed uh -huh. that reading is that reading backwards no it's reading the right way okay to me it reads it reads pieces. backwards this was the book that i got produced what it would say backwards from the editing Doob. <laughs> uh, and the one personal question i had was um the first song that will i'll be playing and the immediately follows god if god i've always loved this song if god could make the angels I, I swear to God, I've heard it hundreds of times since we met and um, still brings a tear to my eyes by the end. Oh. And I've always wondered what its origins were. Uh -huh. um, oh, I wish I could remember. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can just make something up. Well, it? <laughs> it, was, uh, it was obviously, I was obviously having a little bit of argument with the almighty at the time, wasn't I? I mean, it, it, seems, to be a, it seems to be a question and answer session. And right. It was a. It, I think it came from a conversation I was having with a filmmaker called Laurie Flynn. He'd come to visit me in a little in a little village called Starston in Norfolk, and we were walking down to the church. And I was saying to him, you know, I find it very hard to to forgive him for things like you know, the Holocaust and blah blah blah. And he says, "But the question is, can he forgive? Can he forgive us?" 
<laughs> and, I, and I think that might have been something to do with it. I'm not sure if it was already written at that point, but I think it probably wasn't. And, and I think maybe that was the spark. Because certainly right. that's the question. Can we forgive him? Can he forgive you? you know, right. And who takes the rap for the evil we do. Um, one thing that uh, um, I've always thought about forgiveness, that it being the theme in this show, is that um, unlike other paths to enlightenment or self-realization or whatever, it is a very emotional path. You know, you don't forgive without feeling deeply. And, no, you don't. There's no way to bluff that. Right. And to me, that song, it's so... Um, it's, it's poignant because it's the beginning, to me, it's like the beginning of a forgiveness process when you realize how deep, deeply sunk we are. <laughs> you know, it's a, that, well, it's a very powerful thing. I mean, it's, if you look at the whole civil rights movement and you look at Martin Luther King and you look at the whole, you look at the largesse of Nelson Mandela and all this, the whole history of forgiveness is a, is a, is a it's almost a, it's almost a trilogy waiting to be written, isn't it? Right, right. Um, That's the most so any, powerful, it's been a powerful agent for change, for the better, time yes. and time again. Yes, yes, the Speaks reconciliation. this novice who knows nothing about it, but that's just been my, my right. first foray into the subject. Right. <laughs> and I was going to, I was going to pull a little trick on you and say that um, since this episode is about forgiveness, um, I want to ask you how you're feeling these days about Brexit and Boris, but it's probably too soon. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm certainly too soon for Trump. Um, yeah, I know I, I want to see him prosecuted within the full extent of the law when it comes to Trump, because I think justice trumps forgiveness in this right. one instance. Um, but I think, so to I think speak. For, but I think for reconciliation and forgiveness, there has to be, I mean, the best thing that the Senate could do would be to un, be united in, in their condemnation and in censoring them, because I think that would produce healing. And I think healing produces forgiveness. Healing, forgiveness should come first, ideally, but we're not all saints, you know. Right, right, right. I don't and there, know, it's a ne very big subject. <laughs> right. Well, we have- Getting uh, into philosophical minefields in five minutes, you know. We have 30 seconds left, so if you <laughs> <Okay>. can- <laughs> That was great talking to you, Patrick. Have a great life. See you again in 15 years. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, the only thing, thing I actually wanted to ask is, what are you up to now? You just recently released an album, right? Yeah, it's kind of, that's kind of something I can say yes to pretty much all the time, though, because I'm, <laughs> the older I get, the faster I'm knocking them out, because I'm feeling that feeling of, if I don't do it now, I might, I might not remember my own name in another six months or two years. Even then, you know? <laughs> I'm at that senior age where I don't know how much time I've really got left to get this done. And that feeling of increasing urgency actually right. quite possesses me. So I'm, I'm surprisingly driven to make these records at the moment. I've made three in the last three years. And I've got and a fourth one ready. While you've always been indie and always, you know, faced the Not problems. always, actually. I kind of went indie when I kind of went indie with the arrival of the internet. I had, I had major labels for a few oh, years. Oh, okay. It's off and on, off and on. I mean, okay. I have a love-hate relationship with record companies that goes back right. to the beginning of my career, really. Right. You know, I mean, they love you, they love you, they love you. You don't make them rich, they, so they hate you. Next, you know, they love you, they right. love you, they love you. They don't make enough money for them, they hate you. They want, right. they want, record companies want, I mean, they want hits and they want big hits and they're not satisfied with much less than global domination. And, and it's very hard with a label to keep them satisfied that you sell enough. And back in the day, in the 80s before the internet, you know, 100,000 units was considered failure. It's very hard to imagine now, you know. Right. Um, right. But then, you know, if you, if you were selling something like 80,000 units as I was, they would just look at you like you were something they'd scraping off their shoes. Right. And it's getting, getting that repeated treatment of being um, seduced and then spurned album after album with a different label each time you know it did it just got too much and by i think by the by around about the time that's that this song that you played god, god could make the angels if the time that comes out came out it was my eighth album i think i'd had enough really i was done huh. with them huh. that was that um, was the last straw in fact as i recall 
And so, I yeah, know since then I stayed independent. I know that the combination of COVID and Brexit has curtailed any touring. Absolutely. Um, um, and well, COVID has certainly, and Brexit is probably going to make future touring uneconomic mm. because, you know, artists in the UK would just tour Europe as I do regularly. Right. So I've got about, I've got about 60 dates penciled that I can't ink. Um, but the, the additional costs, I mean, if you imagine a tour of, say, six or seven countries in Europe, each one requiring visas, each one requiring carnets, each one requiring um, pe extensive paperwork just to cover selling a few CDs there, right. all of that put together, it just, I'm not saying you couldn't do it, but you'd be doing it for a hobby. I think it would, it would probably take several thousand pounds out of the budget. In right, terms of right. additional costs, and, and those several thousand pounds is kind of what you pay yourself for a tour. And have you changed your um, sales and distribution strategy as a result? I mean, do I have you... it's very slightly. Um, there, that hasn't been much of a strategy for the music business for twenty five years, truthfully. Not since the internet, which we all we all thought was going to be a, a brave new world in a good way. Uh, it, it has a, came with very mixed blessings for the music business um, without getting into that in too much detail. Right. So yes, I have, um, I have set up a Patreon account, a Patreon account. So I have patreon.com slash David Knopfler, which is uh, where I have a small collection of lovely fans. I, I don't even like using the word fans. They're more like friends these days. Right. But we are, we've become a kind of collective and, um, and so I can discuss new records and new tracks. I mean, just, just yesterday I played them three different versions of a song that I'm going to put on the next album. Which one do you like best? You know, and they oh. have a little poll. So you actually get very positive feedback. And I said, I'm thinking of adding this. And I'm thinking of doing that. Tomorrow I'm going to send them the artwork for a best of album and maybe give them an A-B choice as to which cover they prefer. And, and it's not academic. It's real. I mean, for me, it's a real... You know, I actually so often you find yourself asking yourself questions with nobody else to answer. It's quite nice to have 75 or 100 people who are <laughs> right, know, right, right on the subject and know as much about you as maybe more about you than you do, and who are right. going to be very receptive to different ideas and think about them and give you considered replies. So, yeah, it's great. <laughs> All right. Well, great. It's so good to be uh, back in touch. I don't think we've actually conversed person to person no, since you were. Last out here in America, I should think. Yeah, 2013. As that America. sounds about right. Gosh, yeah, it's hard yeah. to believe it's that long ago. Uh, so uh, we're going to seg from this into this beautiful video of, of my favorite David Knopfler song, If God Could Make the Angels. Later in the show, uh, Say It Isn't So, and Jericho, which okay. again is one of your older ones and another favorite yes. one. Yes. So uh, thanks so much for participating and my good pleasure. to see you. All righty. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks. This mess of falling angel must fit his immortal plan. How every flower should open, how every crippled bird should fly, and a cry of love. From the deepest, darkest ocean Flies up through his brightest broken sky But I can't point no finger You can't do nothing more to me, see 
Here's my broken hammer I can't play A flat But I'm still playing in that key And if the holy saints are silent There's this patron full of souls Who've purged grail for the money Mammon's kingdom and his power All his pain and glory Yeah, but glory holds a key And here's this broken hammer I can't fix this old piano Seems sometimes like you can't get enough of me God could make them angels With only mud and dust and sand Making blood from living water Song high in the sky, sailing clear across the oceans. Some hear his voice in every bell and rings. They say it's God who made the angels. From infinity and sin. But if heaven made the angels, who in hell made man? If God could make angels, if God could make angels, why in hell make man? I'm sure we've all been screwed over at one point in our lives. <laughs> I'm also sure that at least at one point we thought to forgive. There's many variations of wise words out there telling us that a life without forgiveness is a life in prison. Famous sayings like, to forgive is to set a prisoner free and discover that the prisoner was you. Or holding on to anger is like grasping a hot coal with the intent of throwing it at someone else, but you're the one who gets burned. It's as if all forgiveness is self-forgiveness, and if all attack is self-attack. In this sense, cultivating forgiveness is the means to help neutralize one's anger and resentment while removing emotional barriers to finding peace, freedom, and happiness. While it might sound too good to be true, the benefits of forgiveness are backed up by psychological research. Dr. Luskin, a counselor and health psychologist at Stanford University, has conducted a number of psychological studies that showed forgiveness provided vital benefits to one's mental and physical well-being. For instance, forgiveness has consistently been shown to reduce anger, hurt, depression, and stress, and lead to greater feelings of optimism, hope, compassion, and self-confidence. Those who practiced forgiveness also demonstrated a reduction in heart disease and physical pain, and an increase and improvement in one's immune response. Wow, so clearly forgiveness is a great and powerful thing, right? But before I go even further, I have to stop and say, Psychological definitions of forgiveness often do not align with definitions in the general public. You know, these different definitions have created confusion. And because of this, it's easier for psychologists to define forgiveness by first describing what forgiveness is not. 
To forgive someone does not mean forgetting or downplaying an offense. It does not mean behaving in a weak or timid manner. It does not relieve someone of responsibility for what they have done, nor does it erase accountability. Forgiveness is not denial. It's not about turning a blind eye or even turning the other cheek, which is what most people might think. Forgiveness is best understood as an internal psychological process, change in emotions, motivations, and attitudes that often lead to behavioral changes. For example, a person who grew up in an abusive household can forgive without trusting their offenders and without choosing to have close relationships with them. Strong boundaries can remain intact and safety can continue to exist for this person. Just because they forgave doesn't mean that all goes away. As I said before, in order for us to truly understand what it means to forgive, we must first understand what it means not to. Negative life events, if significant enough, can get encoded in memory and often cause us to have physical and emotional reactions to remembering the painful experience. Now a disturbing memory seems as, seems as if it's in the past, but there is no memory in the past because the past does not exist. Now is the only time there really is. Therefore, the memory of a grievance can only exist right now in this present moment. The grievance itself becomes your present experience and in this way, it does imprison you by keeping you stuck in the past, a time that no longer exists but which you insist to relive. This is the equivalent of holding a grudge. From the perspective of psychological research then, holding a grudge is considered an imagined emotional response. This would suggest that one must fuel the negative emotions in order to sustain them over a long period of time. For example, vengeful thoughts that embellish and describe the event with contempt only intensify the emotional imagery and physiological experience. In this sense, they caused the first wound, but you are causing the rest. They got it started, but you keep it going. You think they made you feel this way, and maybe at one point or many points in the past they did. But when you won't forgive, you are the one inflicting the pain on yourself today. Forgiveness then is about letting go of that grudge, which again, psychologically means to let go of that imagined emotional response. One can do this by changing their emotional response, which takes many forms, such as perspective taking, benefit finding, connecting to the greater good, cultivating empathy, um, and neutralizing hostility. Clearly, forgiveness is not one skill, but several including acceptance, shifting perspectives, emotional regulation, compassion, and radical responsibility. It is no easy task, and it is not for the faint of heart. This is because one must walk through the fire in order to forgive. When we take shortcuts, and by that I mean what we forgive too quickly and, and too freely doesn't stay forgiven because we haven't allowed ourselves to actually heal from the wound. As I tell my clients all the time, the healing is in the feeling. It's important to identify and express the deep hurt emotions that are hard to forgive and even harder to forget. Ryan Howes, a clinical psychologist, described four elements of forgiveness that outlines what it takes to forgive. In his words, Whatever the crime or injustice or violation, the forgiver needs to fully express how it made them feel. If the transgression elicits anger or sadness or hurt, those feelings need to be deeply felt and expressed. If it's possible to express it to the perpetrator, great. If not, stand in an empty chair, a therapist, um, a heartfelt letter or yelling in the car with the windows rolled down or in an empty field, it, it might suffice. Are you expunging all the feelings? Probably not, but enough to allow you to focus on the other areas. Once we are able to identify and express the emotional experience of our pain, then we make attempts to understand why it happened. 
We might continue to search for some explanation until it's satisfied. Maybe we won't agree with the rationale, but we need some schema, some understanding that explains why the act took place. Or we can simply come to terms with the reality that there isn't always a reason and that you don't have to have it all figured out to move forward. Finally, rebuild safety. Whether it comes in the form of a sincere apology from the perpetrator, a stronger defense against future attacks or removal from that person's influence, safety needs to be reacquired. These three elements help us process the event. It's how I feel, how I understand what happened and how I know it won't happen again. On to the fourth and final step, letting go. This very difficult step is a decision. Letting go is making a promise to not hold a grudge. It's making a promise to yourself that you'll stop dwelling, replaying, ruminating, perseverating on the injustice. If letting go feels impossible, it's probably because the other steps I just mentioned weren't sufficiently completed. Indeed, forgiveness is more than four elements and it's an ongoing process with many moving parts. It helps to be patient with yourself. And when you become discouraged, to remember that all forgiveness is self-forgiveness. And here's a perfect anecdote to reflect this message. 27 years with hard labor, one visitor every six months, never thought life in prison could get any harder. Friends and relatives were hounded, detained, and tortured. If there ever was a man who deserved revenge, it was him. He fought for freedom and they chained him. Nelson Mandela. When asked if he still gets angry, Mandela replied, as I walked out the door toward the gate that would lead to my freedom, I knew if I didn't leave my bitterness and hatred behind, I'd still be in prison. So that leaves me with these few questions I'd like for you to ponder. What would your life look like if you could forgive the unforgivable, one thing, or maybe a couple things in your life that you just find so hard to forgive. How do you know when you've truly forgiven? How does it feel to be forgiven? And finally, what would the world be like with more forgiveness?
distance Are the glamour and romance From memories forgotten long ago Oh baby say it isn't so It isn't so And I've seen you suffer the madding crowd When the grill was shining right there on the ground It was shining like a crown And I know you know That as you reap so you so, oh baby, say it isn't so. Say it isn't so. I'm not too proud. Just to say I love you right out loud And in my prayer My love for you is all that I'll declare Say it isn't so For I know my heart is breaking Pretend you didn't know Though our dreams are all forsaken in shadow riding shotgun That reaper he's still waiting Waiting for his last dance And the last words of a love song Reasons forgotten long ago But as you reap so you will sow Last chance to say Say it isn't so Say it isn't so It isn't so It isn't so I'm very glad to be here with novelist Wally Lamb. Um, he's been a New York Times bestseller for a number of titles, um, beginning with She's Come Undone. Um, that was in the early 90s, right, Wally? Yeah, that was published in 92. Okay. Uh, then I Know This Much Is True, which was uh, last year made into a HBO miniseries. Uh, for which Mark Ruffalo won the uh, Best Actor Emmy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, also, The Hour I First Believed, Wishing and Hoping, Weir Water, and I'll Take You There. Um, Not and I've always wanted to uh, have this opportunity, Wally, to tell in public my Wally Lamb story. Um, <laughs> <laughs> which goes back I to, the, up to the desk here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, which goes back to the the first and I think last time I saw you. And this was somewhere sometime in the 90s, mid 90s. I think maybe it was when I know this much is true had come out. And um, <laughs> your agency, which at the time was the Linda Chester agency, for whom my wife at the time, Laurie Fox, worked, uh, the agency arranged a meet and greet with Hollywood producers. And so we were all in LA, I was driving, you were there, uh, Laurie was there. Um, and I think Judith Reagan, was she your publisher at the time? She was. Yes, Judith Reagan was there. And it was at the um, home, I think of Catherine Oxenberg, the actress. I'm amazed, I'm amazed that I can remember that. Um, <laughs> and, um, so uh, we go in and I and we're hanging out for a while and um, 
I, not being too great at parties myself, I was just kind of whiling away the time waiting till we could get out of there. And all of a sudden it was either Catherine or Linda or Laurie. Somebody came up to me and said, um, we can't find Wally. Um, he's, we searched all over the house and you know, these producers and agents want to talk to him and he, he's vanished. Uh, and, and she asked me, can you go look for him? And um, I said, I guess, uh, but you're sure he's not in the house? And she said, yeah. So I went outside and the, um, this was somewhere in Hollywood. Anyway, it was a mixed use commercial district. So just down the hill from the house, there was a shopping area. I was pretty sure you hadn't gone shopping. Uh, <laughs> but so I was kind of puzzled as to where you might have gone. And I, I, I walked a block or two and this being Hollywood uh, or close by, I saw a wax museum <laughs> and something just clicked. I, <laughs> I knew that's where Wally Lamb would go. So I, I uh, went up to the ticket office. I got a ticket, walked in. Sure enough, there you were. And I said, uh, Wally, you got to come back to the party. All these producers are here to meet you. And um, nobody knows where you are. And you sighed. And I swear to God, this is what you said, Wally. You sighed and said, I know that everyone in here is just so much more interesting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I couldn't have said that. No, no, no. <laughs> now, um, I say that was some that was some years ago. I, I do remember that. I, <laughs> I remember it very well, Patrick. And, <laughs> and I remember, you know, you said you're not uh, you're not exactly uh, Mister. I love parties, and neither am I. And that, and I remember what motivated me uh, to hide out in the wax museum, and that was my <laughs> social anxiety. <laughs> Well, it took 20 some years, but I would assume that your relationship with Hollywood producers improved uh, <laughs> given the production of a, I Know This Much Is True. So could you tell us a little bit about how this HBO production um, came about, how long it took? Yeah, sure. Well, um, uh, the novel, I Know This Much Is True, uh, was published in 1998. Uh, right out of the gate, it was bought by, um, uh, by 20th Century Fox. Uh, they tried for many years uh, to make it uh, and uh, no, nothing worked. They couldn't, you know, it's a big book and they right. couldn't get it into the package of a, of a one and a half, two hour movie. Um, and so it was just sort of languishing. And, uh, and then along, while that's happening for 15 years, along comes all these premium TV channels who start doing uh, series, limited series. Um, so the time was right. Uh, uh, my uh, agent now, um, uh, Cassie Abyshevsky, she looked at the fine print of the contract and said, you know, uh, the rights revert back to you after 15 years if they don't make the movie. So mm -hmm. um, that was a, <laughs> that was miraculous. And, um, uh, and Cassie said, who, uh, who I, she said, who would you like to, um, you know, do this, do this movie? Who would you like to star in it? And I said, well, is that, is that going to be my choice? And she said, yeah. I go, wow, that's surprising. Yeah. So I said, uh, first choice, only choice, Mark Ruffalo. She sent the book to Mark. Uh, he was in Europe doing a movie. Uh, he wrote back almost immediately, kind of apologetically, uh, because he's a slow reader. <laughs> as am I, yeah, uh, but he said, you know, I'm in, I want to do this, uh, uh, we'll make it happen, and indeed he did. He and I have become really good friends now, and, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, so many people love Mark, and, um, you know, really admire his, uh, his political engagement with the world, and, um, and I found him to be just exactly um, the way uh, people would want him to be. He's very, right. Very down to earth, good guy, works hard, uh, very sincere. So. Right. Um, for those who don't know, uh, I know this much is true is a big book. It's like 900 pages. I've been 
revisiting it on Kindle and um, I'll probably finish in September or, <laughs> but it's basically- I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what happens. It's no <laughs> well, I did, I did binge the series and I had read it before, at least most of it before. Um, <laughs> anyway, it's the story of two twins, Dominic and Thomas Birdsey. Um, one of them, Dominic, is identified as schizophrenic and his twin, Thomas, is just um, angry. And um, one of the thing in the beginning of the book opens with um, a violent act by Dominic, an act against himself. I've got to switch those two around because uh, Thomas is the, uh, the person suffering from schizophrenia. Oh, okay, sorry, sorry. Dominic's okay. the angry one. <laughs> okay, okay. So Thomas uh, does horrific act of, of, of self-destruction. And the rest of the book is sort of about how that comes to be, if not healed, uh, at least integrated into their lives. And, and one thing that struck me in rereading it is that um, uh, having grown up with a, a mom who was diagnosed as borderline schizophrenic, one of the things that struck me is that while Thomas has the identified problem and a diagnosis and is institutionalized, um, he's kind of an, he's an innocent. You know, the, the, the world is just too much for him. And so, um, and he wants to fix it and, and he chooses very strange ways. Uh, Dominic copes, but it's only through chronic anger you know, just unrelenting about everything. And I, I kept thinking, you know, how many people are like that? How many people keep their stasis <laughs> through maintaining their anger, which is sort of a theme of our times right now. Um, so I was curious as, as you were creating it, were you consciously dealing with the, the, these issues of, of, let's say anger versus insanity and forgiveness? Were you consciously thinking about forgiveness or did the story just sort of tell itself? Uh, the latter, Patrick. I, um, I'm always envious of when I read about writers' techniques and uh, some writers have the ending in mind and they plot it out or outline it and, and write toward a preconceived ending. It doesn't work that way for me at all. And in fact, all I had at the beginning uh, was the angry voice of Dominic. Um, mm. I didn't even know he had a brother, let alone an identical wow. twin. Uh, I just let him talk. And, um, and as I did, I realized that uh, the, uh, the source of his anger had to do with his relationship with this brother. Um, hmm. So it wasn't, you know, for me, it's, it's almost like sculpture. You know, you start with a big slab of something and you start chipping away at it and something, in my case, a story, a novel, little by little emerges. It wasn't until I was done with the, with the first draft, as I, uh, as I can recall, uh, that uh, I had that theme in mind. And then, of course, once you see what themes are embedded in the story you've told, then you can better understand what that story means. Um, right. And what it means to me more than the reader, um, because I, I'm, I'm of the opinion that readers are welcome to take whatever they want or whatever they need from the story. But I was definitely, uh, by the second draft, I was definitely on to the whole theme of forgiveness. And, um, you know, there's a, there's a, if you remember, there's a story within the story uh, in, that, in that book about Dominic and Thomas's Italian immigrant grandparents. And um, that's kind of like the beating heart of the film, of the, uh, well, the film too, but also uh, the novel when I was writing it. And um, it's sort of a cautionary tale for Dominic because his, uh, his maternal grandfather is doomed because he can't forgive. Um, he's a vengeful old bitter man uh, who is incapable of forgiveness. And um, so, so Dominic has to learn from that grandfather's story, which he 
writes and uh, and leaves to his uh, you know his his children and his grandchildren, and um, so that's that's you know for me that is where the core meaning of the of the not where I discovered it, not so much where I started right. out. And how? What would you say about how far? Dominic gets with forgiveness. <laughs> you know, it's because I, I think w- when I've done workshops and taught about forgiveness, I'm always telling people it's it's a process, not an achievement. Mm-hmm. You know, <laughs> Very true. You, you don't get it done and go on with your life. You, it's a change over time. And often, if you're doing it seriously, you do discover that you're not just forgiving your problem, your problems or your parents' problems, you're also giving their parents and their parents, you know. Um, so how, how would you describe that, how far the character gets? I mean, or, or were you conscious of um, wanting to get him to get to a certain stage or watching what he did? Because I know with fiction, you're often sort of watching what happens as you write. That is exactly true for me anyway. Um, I. I, I write these characters, I call them the walking wounded. And then I have to keep writing to find out if they're gonna be okay by the end of the end of the story. And I don't and I don't really know. I don't preconceive it. So uh, in Dominic's case, um, he reads his grandfather's uh, diary, uh, and then he's given the problem of a stepfather who he's very resentful of. And uh, right. And uh, his brother at that at that point um, has passed away, and he's left with this. Uh, his mother has passed away, and he's left with this man who he, uh, in some ways, uh, has been complicit with in terms of bullying Thomas. But also, um, he's a guy who, who who he has deeply resented from childhood, and the challenge for him uh, is uh, as as the father, the stepfather loses his power and his control over him, you know, becomes uh, uh, an old man who has a lot of health needs. Um, the challenge for Dominic is, can he get past all of that hatred and resentment and, um, and forgive uh, it by, by practicing, by, uh, you know, by forgive by with acts, little things like, shaving his stepfather's uh, whiskers, right, and that right. kind of thing. And um, so he's in, he's in much better shape by the end of the novel, uh, which I was relieved for. <laughs> <laughs> um, one thing I'm interested in, I, I, you know, I've literally written a lot about forgiveness, mm-hmm. but the, I discovered the process of, of doing two novels on my own that, um, Fiction can be a way to um, to go through a forgiveness process that's uh, w- what would I say not literal, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and and I was wondering for, for you with this long record of of fiction, um, is there a way in which forgiveness is always an ongoing element of of what you're doing as a writer? Yeah, I don't know about anybody else, but for me, yes. Um, it, forgiveness is uh, is something that I'm really wrestling with now in this novel in progress that I'm putting together. And uh, I'll just tell you that uh, the, the the main character uh, is a young father who is um, negligent and responsible for uh, his uh, his young young child's death. And, oh. and the question becomes, can he forgive himself? Can his wife forgive him? Can the uh, justice system forgive him? Uh, and they're complicated issues, but I, I'm right back with the whole forgiveness thing. And also, um, I, I have learned so much about um, forgiveness uh, from the women at, uh, at the uh, state of Connecticut uh, correctional facility. I've been um, I've been volunteering there for about 20 years now, and I've taught them a little about writing, and they have taught me a lot 
uh, about uh, about the world and about life. Right, and you did. Uh, you got two collections of their work published. One couldn't keep it to myself, and the other I'll fly away. Mm -hmm. um, what is it? Uh, it is there one or two most dramatic stories of uh, that you can relate of of what you see these saw these writers go through? Yeah, mo uh, I would say probably the majority uh, of the autobiographical things that they choose to write about um, reflect on the terrible things that they did uh, to get to prison, uh, the terrible things that were done to them when they were kids. And um, and the you know the the struggle to forgive and move on, uh, forgive themselves in a lot of ways. Um, one of the uh, one of the uh, the students who is most memorable to me, uh, a woman named Robin Ledbetter, who has been in prison since she was fourteen. They they um, they gave her a fifty year sentence, and um, she had been a um, she was a runaway, and uh, she wrote a beautiful, beautiful, you know, she had been her, both of her parents died from, uh, I'm sorry, her mom died from AIDS, her father had AIDS, and, um, and she was running the, in the streets, and she, um, what happened was that uh, she hooked up with an older boy, and they decided to, uh, to rob a cab driver, and um, so they got in the cab, and they attempted to rob him, and he fought back, and um, he died because of that. He was uh, he was knifed and he was and he was killed. Um, so Robin gets a fifty-year sentence, and um, and you know she grows up in prison. She's now, I believe, in her late thirties, uh, mm -hmm. and she has until age sixty-four to go. And um, so she struggled uh, to forgive herself. Um, and not to every time something good happened to her when she was in the prison. If she had a little success, she would yank it away from herself. I remember mm -hmm. when the when the galleys came in for that for for her book for their book, and uh, I passed them out to all the women, and they were ooing and eyeing and you know looking at their names and print and forth. And I happened to be sitting next to Robin, and uh, she her book remained closed. And I could hear that she was hyperventilating. And I leaned over and I said, Robin, are you okay? And she said, yeah, um, when good things happen to me, I get scared. Um, and uh, so, so that's a, um, you know, she has been working on forgiving, forgiving herself if, uh, if the harsh uh, state uh, sentence that she has, um, has not been able to, to forgive that. Right, right, right. Um, yeah, one thing that struck me, and I know this much is true, is that um, um, every, you know everyone has a difficult life. It's a it's a world of hurt. You know, there's 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 no one um, who escapes it. And if you think you can escape it by be give, being given a whole bunch of money and becoming a billionaire, we have ample proof that that doesn't. <laughs> That doesn't alone take care of, of um, um, a world of hurt. And um, I often think of the process of, of forgiveness as bittersweet because we are, we tend to identify ourselves at least th through the early part of our lives with all those hurts, all those pains. And um, they become us. And they're hard to let go of. Yeah, and, because they, they become our story uh, right. or the star of our story. Right. And so to let go of it is to watch some of ourselves, you know, slip away. Um, and uh, I, I know I've I, some of the major forgiveness episodes I've gone through in my life where I let go of, of an anger about something will be followed with this period of confusion and disorientation, which I'm asking myself, well, what do I do now? <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I would imagine it's even worse for someone who's incarcerated and your, your mistake or your crime is 
in front of you all the time. You're, you know. And sadly, with uh, a lot of the women that I work with, um, they are they are infamous and they are being punished for the one terrible thing that they did in their lives. You know, a, a lot of women who uh, took abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, verbal abuse uh, from batterers and from you know terrible right. partners and so forth. Um, and then one day they snapped and uh, they couldn't take any more. And in a sort of a fever, they, uh, they killed their partner. Um, and you know that, that story has played out over and over again in 20 years. Right. Um, you know. yeah, before we leave, uh, I know this much is true. I just wanna read um, the last, uh, it's from, this is from the last paragraph of the book. Uh, I'm not a smart man particularly, but one day at long last, I stumbled from the dark woods of my own and my family's and my country's past, holding in my hands these truths that love grows from the rich loam of forgiveness, that mongrels make good dogs, and that the essence of God exists in the roundness of things. So it's, you know, once I know that the story is largely about forgiveness, I can sort of, uh, you know, tie that ribbon around the package and go. Right, right. Uh, do you have a title for the upcoming work that people can look for? <laughs> yeah, it's, I think it, this is a tentative title, but I think I'm happy with it. Uh, I think it is, is gonna be uh, called The River is Wide. From a, um, oh. it's from a, a Pete Seeger song. All of my all of my book titles are, are connected to songs in some way. Right, right. I was going to ask you. I was going to ask you about that. Um, well, wonderful. I'm glad we reconnected all after all this time, even if it's um, in this weird medium. <laughs> well, you make it easy, uh, Patrick. <laughs> but you know, um, come to think of it. Um, a wax museum is probably a fairly COVID safe environment. <laughs> I don't know, if, I don't know if, the, uh, if, if the wax figures are masked or not. Right, the celebrities don't have to, <laughs> the celebrities don't have to be masked. I'll tell you very quickly that, you know, uh, uh, my wife Chris and I have a little, uh, we, you know, we live largely in Connecticut, but we have a little place in New York. And um, when people come in and stay with us there, you know, they're always looking for fun New York things to do. And very often I will say, well, would you like to go to Madame Tussauds Wax <laughs> <laughs> And usually they look at me and say, uh, I was thinking maybe along the lines of Ellis Island or something. <laughs> so, but I have snuck in there in that place a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> so so, so it's, it's, it's still your favorite place for a party, basically. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> All right. Well, um, thanks very much. And I'm sure everyone will look forward to the next um, project. And just to remind everyone that you can still see the uh, six, it's six episodes of yeah. mm -hmm. uh, the HBO miniseries. I know this much is true, uh, starring Mark Ruffalo. Um, and thanks very much. Thank you, Patrick. I've had fun. And uh, and be well, and uh, thanks to everybody for listening. All righty. Bye-bye. Was long ago near Jericho, Joshua lit the spark. A soldier from a holy war lay dying in the dark. He heard the final trumpet through the sacred culling ground. He heard a sound like thunder as walls came tumbling down. Jericho. Well, he prayed to find redemption, prayed for inner peace. 
He preyed upon the innocents Searching for release He traveled far behind the lines Cut the sacred wire He put his lips up against the steel Like a symbol of desire Jericho Jericho My lifeline was his holy cross, a giver of sweet gifts. Small mercies for the dying on another graveyard shift. The vultures split the bones apart, sucked the wishbone clean. That siren song echoes on aboard that ship of dreams. Jericho. Jericho. There was a final consecration, a final calling card, a lifetime's culmination for the grace that came so hard. The blood was coursing through his veins, he knew the final score. His sword lay in the scabbard, and death was at the door. Jericho. Jericho. I was in the heartlands, standing at the shore I was on that last train leaving like my father had before The year was 2021 with love and loss and more And I stand just east of Eden just like thousands have before Jericho Jericho One morning, when I was 32, I awoke with a stomach ache that would not go away for seven years. In fact, it would quickly get much worse, soon accompanied by a nasty assortment of other symptoms that included muscle pains, mental fog, total and persistent exhaustion, extended hours of non-refreshing sleep, massive outbreaks of eczema, and more. Thoroughly confounded for several months after the onset, plus several fruitless visits to puzzled doctors, some of the mystery was cleared up when I found a physician who specialized in AIDS cases. After a thorough exam and an array of blood tests, he told me the news, which was um, kind of split down the middle. I did not have AIDS, but I did have a more mysterious ailment, which had only recently been labeled as chronic fatigue syndrome, or CFS. My doctor explained the difference this way. The good news is that you're not going to die. The bad news is that you're going to wish you would, and probably for a long time to come. 
He went on to explain that not much was known about CFS, either in terms of causes or effective treatments, and not much more is known 30-some years later. It is known that CFS results from a hyperactive immune system, in other words, the body attacking itself in a haphazard attempt to protect itself. That knowledge alone would begin to shift my awareness of what was going on. But realizing there was no immediate medical cure, I got myself into therapy and at the same time encountered a mysterious spiritual discipline known as A Course in Miracles. Now, I couldn't make heads or tails of the course at first, and mostly I kept it a secret from friends because, frankly, I was embarrassed to be studying something that sounded kind of religious, but in the weirdest way possible. Other course students out there will know what I mean. I did soon grasp that the course is all about forgiveness. Many of its 365 workbook lessons especially in the early part, direct the student in specific forgiveness exercises to change our views of the most difficult people in our lives. In my case, that was my mother, who was a psychiatric drug addict with manic depressive tendencies and borderline schizophrenia. A severe case of what is now called bipolar Although that was her diagnosis, it did not fully explain how she behaved towards my father, my two sisters, and myself. When she was in a bad way, she treated all of us with suspicion, hostility, and outright emotional cruelty. And that happened far too often. As I did my early work with the Course, I recognized how impossible it seemed to forgive her. At the same time, I was beginning to realize that my illness was rooted in a deep and abiding anger that I was not admitting. Regardless of how much sympathy I had for my mom and her struggle just to get through each day, I was angry that she hid behind her psychiatric diagnosis and never took responsibility for just being mean. I didn't see how or why I should give up my anger about that, especially if she was never going to face herself and uh, fess up. I was also angry in a lesser way at my dad for never doing anything effective to shield me and my sisters from my mother's worst behaviors. I realized that my persistent anger towards both of them was a kind of armor I had developed against being hurt anymore. Except that, by now, I was 3,000 miles away from my parents, uh, by no means living under their thumb. So it slowly began to dawn on me that my anger was outdated and no longer protecting me from anything. In fact, I strongly suspected that it was making me very sick. Concerned about my health and convinced that I had indeed contracted AIDS, um, my parents flew out to California from North Carolina to talk to my physician. He reassured them that the worst case scenario was not in play and that I had just fallen prey to one of those trendy West Coast illnesses that had yet to catch on everywhere. Before they left, I sat down with my parents to try to say something to them about my tentative exploration of forgiveness. I did not specifically mention the word, nor say anything about forgiving them, because I just wasn't that far along. All I remember saying is something vague, like, I want you to know that I've been looking back on our family history, and I guess I'm starting to see things differently. Now, I knew that sounded vague, so I expected to see a zero response. Instead, my mother took my father's hand and said, Yes, son, when I look back myself, I don't understand why I've always been so angry with everybody all the time and so hostile. I just couldn't help it for some reason. 
My dad smiled at her and said, no, Janie, I've never understood it either, and I sure didn't know what to do for you. Suddenly, I felt like someone had hit me with a gigantic soft pillow that sent my consciousness flying right out of my body. I don't remember what I said in response, but I do remember that after they left, I walked from my apartment into the woods and wept solidly for a couple hours. I was extremely disoriented and overcome with an exceptionally powerful feeling of bittersweetness. That's because I had quite unexpectedly heard straight from my mother's mouth in person exactly the confession I had always been angry about not getting. I was overwhelmed, not with joy or righteousness, but with the question, so what do I do now? I realized in short that I had been living with a restless anger 24-7 for my entire life up to that point. And suddenly, the rug had been pulled out from under that anger. Now I obviously had to let it go, but I literally didn't know what else to feel, think, or obsess about. There was a sweetness in the victory of it, but a bitterness in having to let go of the anger that had defined my inner life for so long. And I marveled that I hadn't actually said anything to my parents about forgiveness. Merely admitting that I've begun to look at our family differently triggered an unprecedented and certainly unexpected openness from my folks. As it turned out, this remarkable event was one of the first dramatic turning points in my illness. I was in a tearful, altered state for several days afterward, during which some of my most painful symptoms began to ease a bit. Complete recovery would take another six years, and I would have to learn a lot more about other kinds of anger I harbored. But this was my first big step toward healing. Just the other day, I was revisit, revisited by that amazing feeling of tearful, bitter sweetness. When Donald Trump left Washington and the new Biden-Harris administration took power, the situation was not exactly parallel. I don't ever expect Trump or his followers to confess anything. But as I saw chronic hostility, meanness, and emotional dysfunction leaving our nation's capital and being replaced by basic human decency and adult competence. I realized how identified I had been with anger and resentment for the last four years. Now, for the sake of the country, there will have to be a political reckoning, and I leave that process up to the politicians. Forgiving is not forgetting. And there is a way of assigning and requiring accountability that is not simply revenge. How we achieve that as a society remains to be seen. For myself, though, I have a vivid memory of how the bittersweet flavor of forgiveness began to heal me and what the fruits of that work would prove to be. We're all still in a world of hurt, but at least now we can start taking steps toward the blossoming of forgiveness. Mm -hmm.